Hey guys, Dr. Justin Markajani here. Today we're gonna be talking about the top five ways you can reduce your leaky gut. We're gonna dive into this topic today. And before we do, please smash the like button. Really appreciate it. Make sure you subscribe to get notifications of great content coming your way. Love to see your feedback in the comments section as well. We'll be responding there too. All right, so out of the gate, I get this question a lot of times, right? It's a big trendy word, leaky gut. What is it? What can we do to actually reduce it? We're gonna dive into some of the underlying physiology of what's happening underneath the hood. So first off, leaky gut symptoms can be a range of anything from mood, so fatigue, brain fog, it could be anxiety, depression, anywhere to your typical IBS symptoms, constipation, diarrhea, digestive symptoms, digestive upset, but again, you can have a lot of issues with gut issues, gut permeability, and it cannot affect your gut. It may, it may be cognitive, it may be emotional, it may be energy. So it usually goes over a lot of people's heads that it can be something that's not even gut or gastrointestinal related. We call this extra intestinal, outside of the intestinal type of symptoms. All right, so what is leaky gut? I'm gonna pull up a screen picture for you guys so you can see here, but just using my hands, we have our tight junctions that look like this. These are called pterocytes. They line our small intestinal tract. And as we start to engage with inflammation from different foods, chemicals, um, environmental things, whether it's pesticides, glyphosate, bacteria, these can cause these tight junctions, right? These enterocytes to open up slightly. And we have particulate can get through, whether it's LPS from bacteria, lipopolysaccharides, the outer shell of the bacteria. It could be different undigested food proteins, but these get into the bloodstream. And yes, in. So technically, inside your intestinal tract is actually outside your body, kind of weird. But then it goes into the bloodstream, and that's where your immune system sees it. You have antigen-presenting cells. You have T-cell responses. You have inflammation. All kinds of different things happen. We'll kind of talk about that in just one second so it makes sense to you guys. All right, so real quick here out of the gate, just follow the numbers here. This is a good article from Scientific America about a decade ago, but it talks about, first thing is, it's using gluten as a mechanism here. Gluten is a very powerful mechanism of gut permeability. Not the only thing, but gluten is a big thing. So when you look at it out of the gate, you're gonna see number one is undigested gluten fragments get into the bloodstream, right? So they're gonna go through, this is these are your enterocytes, this is the gut barrier, it's gonna get into the bloodstream. Now, thing is these gluten pro proteins have not been broken down adequately because there's probably intolerance, okay? They get into the bloodstream. Now they're starting to react. So we're having gut permeability here. They're starting to accumulate. Now we're starting to have interepithelial, your immune system in beneath, interepithelial lymphocytes are starting to accumulate, meaning your immune system is seeing it and starting to attack it. So you can see over here number three, the gluten induces interleukins. So now we're having interleukins, we have cytokines. These are the byproducts of inflammation. So now the immune cells are starting to go after it. And then number four here, you're gonna see tissue transglutaminase, TTG. You could also see endomycial antibodies start to be released. This is a sign that the tissue is getting damaged. So inflammation is happening, it's the hallmark. The immune system is starting to get involved. So we already talked about the Epithelial cells, the intraepithelial cells, that's the immune. Remember, 80% of your immune cells are in the stomach, in the galt, or in the malt, the mucosal associated lymphoid tissue. So you can see your antigen presenting cells are starting to hear. So the antigen is, which is the foreign gluten, is interacting with the immune system, and that's creating different immune complexes, and it's getting your T helper cells going on there and your natural killer cells. You can see your helper T cells are starting to go in and attack the enterocytes. So the tissue your gut barrier is starting to get intact, starting to get attacked by these natural killer cells. So really important, so we have this whole vicious cycle of inflammation that's happening here. We really wanna to get to the underlying cause of why that's happening. So we have foods, we have the gut barrier, we have immune responses, we have tissue being damaged, we have more natural killer cells, more helper cells, and then what tends to happen as we go down the road here is this term called molecular mimicry. Of other tissues, they get tagged. They have very similar surface proteins as these foods that come in, or as different bacteria like lipopolysaccharides that come in, and other tissues can get damaged in this immune response, right? Call it a mistaken case of identity, if you will. So this is kind of the hallmark of what we're seeing. We're gonna dive in a little bit deeper of what we can do to really get to the root cause of what's happening here. All right, so top five ways to address leaky gut. And again, leaky gut, that's a slang term. It could be gastrointestinal permeability is what you may see more in the scientific literature. Again, one of the big researchers on this topic is Alessio Fasano out of Harvard, who did a lot of the earlier research on gut permeability and gluten. That's a big one. All right, 
So dysbiosis is one of the biggest driving factors. So this is just an imbalance in the bacteria in the gut. So we have a lot more bad bacteria than good bacteria. Now, why does this happen, right? So first off, crummy diets, lots of processed carbohydrate, processed foods, a lot of junk in the foods. We're typically not eating good healthy proteins, good healthy fats. If we're eating fats, it's processed junky oils, refined oxidized vegetable oils. It's not healthy good protein. And carbohydrate wise, we're maybe doing too much carbs, too much starch, too much processed stuff. And so a lot of times when we have junky foods, inflammatory foods, we have processed crap, we have maybe add in artificial sweeteners and sugars, these can tend to drive bad bacteria to grow, right? And then obviously, if we're not getting healthy, beneficial probiotics, lactobacillus from our fermented foods, maybe we're not drinking healthy kombucha, fermented sauerkraut, kimchi, these kind of things. We're also not getting these foods in our diets either from a fermented side. And then we could add in things like pesticides, glyphosates, right? These organochlorines can knock down a lot of the beneficial bacteria. If we're drinking a lot of chlorinated water, it's going to have a negative effect on our microbiome. If we're getting exposed to glyphosate or even potential mold, that can negatively impact our gut bacteria as well. And so we got to make sure we're impacting or kind of trying to get the toxins out. So a good organic, healthy diet is going to be a big thing out of the gate to prevent that dysbiosis from happening. Also, just overexposure to antibiotics, right? We are a easy to prescribe antibiotic society. It's people get a lot of antibiotics at the slightest little sniffle instead of doing other natural things to get to the root cause. And so lots of antibiotics, lots of processed food, lots of processed sugar, maybe too much carbohydrate, uh, not a good, good amount of beneficial probiotics in your diet, not supplementing probiotics either. These are all going to be a big driving factor of why dysbiosis is happening. Now, dysbiosis, you may see it with proteus, Morganella, Citrobacter, Pseudomonas, Klebsiella. These are dysbiotic bacteria. They're in the bad bacteria camp and they're overgrowing. So on a good stool test, we may see it. We may infer it based on a lactulose breath test. We may look at organic acid testing to look at different organic acids, which are like the exhaust byproducts of bad bacteria. Won't tell us exactly what bacteria, but it tells us that something is there we should look at. So dysbiosis is very important to look at. Citrobacter, Klebsiella, these are the ones that we're looking at. These bacteria can produce their gram negative, so that means they're gonna have two outer cell walls. And the outer cell wall, the second wall, is gonna have lipopolysaccharide to it. And that's an endotoxin. So that in itself can create inflammation in the gut and potentially can open up that gut lining and expose the outside or the inside, the outside of your gut to the inside part of your immune system where these antigen presenting cells happen and all these inflammation compounds tend to occur. So out of the gate, we talked about dysbiosis. Inflammation is a big one. Now, inflammation is going to happen due to a lot of different inputs here. So input one is the dysbiosis. That in itself is going to create inflammation, okay? The foods that you're eating, if it's gluten in that article or in that video I just showed you here, this article right here, all of what's happening here with the transglutaminase release and the antigen presenting cells and the, and the helper T cells and the natural killer cells, what's happening is inflammation. And so gluten is one impact of that, but... That can happen from other foods. If we're getting exposure to casein from dairy, that can be a problem. We're getting exposure to lots of processed sugars, processed grains, excess omega-6 processed fatty acids, canola oil, soy oil, right? These are all junky fats. So we want to make sure we're consuming foods that are anti-inflammatory in nature. Healthy grass-fed meat, uh, wild-caught, you know, flash-frozen type of salmon, skipjack tuna. Just good omega-3s can be super helpful, very anti-inflammatory. I want to get it from good whole foods. Maybe supplementing cod liver oil, uh, trying to choose grass-fed meat that's going to have good, healthy gamma linoleic acid in there, which is really good from grass-fed meat. It's going to have a, a good spectrum of amino acids that are very healthy and very anti-inflammatory. It's so very important. Now, out of the gate, inflammation is very important because your adrenals help manage inflammation. They help manage stress. And so if your adrenal glands are depleted due to chronic stress from poor sleep, from poor hygiene, from not consuming good water, good electrolytes, all these things are gonna put stress on your body. And so we have to make sure that your adrenals are supported. So we'll like to look at adrenal testing that kind of really quantifies things, but we're gonna make sure your diet's dialed in. You're getting good nutrient density at every single meal because your body runs on nutrients. It doesn't run on macros like protein, fats, and carbs. It needs that. But if these foods, if you're just consuming carbohydrate and it's from processed sugar, well, there's a nutritional deficit there. So we have to make sure we're getting healthy, full spectrum amino acids grass-fed meat, excellent, good fatty acids, anti-inflammatory, we're getting good, healthy organic vegetables, or if we're getting starch in there, good, healthy, safer starches that are grain-free are going to be key, and these things are loaded with B vitamins, loaded with potassium, magnesium, 
right? Full spectrum phytonutrients, very important, very anti-inflammatory. So we want anti-inflammatory, nutrient dense, right? Organic foods are going to contain more nutrient denseness to it in low toxin. And by being organic, you're not going to have the organochlorine pesticide type of load that you would see with conventional type of foods. That's really important out of the gates. All right, great. So dysbiosis, inflammation, very important. Now, dysbiosis can drive inflammation. We could have other bugs in our guts that can drive inflammation. We could have H. pylori. We could have fungal overgrowth. We could have other parasitic infections. So when we look at the gut, we don't want to just assume that it's all driven by dysbiosis. That's one part of the equation. But I tell patients all the time, you have the right to have more than one thing happening at the same time. So there's a lot of other inputs into this equation we have to look at. So the adrenals help manage stress. They do. They produce cortisol. Um, it's it's going to come downstream and also produce a lot of DHEA and a lot of other sex hormone precursor building blocks, especially if you're a female going into perimenopause, menopause, a lot of your precursor sex hormones are going to come from DHEA. And so if we see low DHEA, that's a precursor to, for men, more testosterone, women, more estrogen as well. That's going to be your precursor building block anabolic hormone. So it's vital we have those hormones there to help build us back up. So dietary recommendations, I'm recommending an autoimmune, lower FODMAP type of template, right? Nutrient-dense, anti-inflammatory, low toxin. Now, AIP is a great starting point because you're going you're gonna to cut out some foods that may be a little bit more inflammatory for some but are still great, like nuts and seeds. Excellent, especially if they're soaked. For most people, they're probably okay, but for people you have a lot, of, a lot of gut issues or a lot of gut inflammation and gut permeability, seeds and nuts may be a problem. If you're consuming eggs, ghee or butter, that may be a problem. Nightshades, right? Tomatoes, potatoes, eggplants, peppers could be a problem. And so out of the gate, we may want to cut those out for a month or so. And also, I recommend a lower FODMAP template that's on the paleo side because there's a lot of foods that have grains in it, that have inflammation in it, that could still be problematic, still not be the best for you. So I want to go paleo, low FODMAP, paleo, autoimmune that focuses on the nutrient density, anti-inflammatory, low toxins. That's a great starting point. But we want to just not, you know, a regular conventional gastrointestinal low FODMAP diet may still accept certain grains, which could be inflammatory, may still accept certain things like that that could be a problem. Another big issue, stress impacts, right? Stress impacts the sympathetic nervous system. What's happening when your sympathetic nervous system is in overdrive? That's moving your blood flow to your extremities, to your arms and your feet to run, fight, and flee. That's going to make it harder for you to make good enzymes, to make good acids. It's going to make it harder for you to activate that vagus nerve, to have that good migrating motor complex so we can move foods from the stomach, have good acid levels to break down and activate our pepsin, pepsinogen to pepsin, to get our bile production from the gallbladder, to get more pancreatic function from the pancreas, lipase, protease. This gets a lot of our enzymes moving. Also, acid by itself is a natural antimicrobial. So if we have good acid production, that's going to make it harder for other bugs and bacteria to hang out. So good stomach acid is important. If we're stressed, we're not going to make it. Uh, if we have not enough acid, enzymes are driven by pH. So acid, increased acid, lowers the pH. Low pH activates your proteolytic enzymes, and it's also going to stimulate your gallbladder to make Bile salts. Bile salts also have a mild antimicrobial effect. So if we don't make good acids, make good enzymes, make good bile salts, it's going to be harder for us to keep the bugs at bay. Really important out of the gates. And so supplementing these things can be very helpful because if we don't digest the foods, you're going to have fermentation. These foods are going to rot. They're going to putrefy. They're going to rancidify. And so a lot of people that have these chronic digestive issues already, right, we may have to cook these foods up more. We may have to use an Instapot. We may have to break these things down more. We may have to focus on really chewing our foods very well, not consuming much hydration with our meal, maybe a couple ounces to get some pills down. But outside of that, 10, 15 minutes before a meal, hour and a half, two hours after. We don't want to dilute our enzymes and acids. Water's got a pH of 7, and your stomach's got a pH of around 2. So if you add a whole bunch of 7 to a pH of 2, you're bringing that pH up. And also, if you have hydrochlor if you have uh, H. pylori, H. pylori produces... Um, a couple of enzymes there, urease is one that will take the protein metabolites of urea and it will spit out CO2 and ammonia. Ammonia's got a pH of 11, so it will actually lower your hydrochloric acid levels, which will lower your enzyme and bile levels inadvertently. So big thing, beneficial bacteria. I already mentioned it in number one. Dysbiosis means more bad bacteria than good. So if we have more bad, we probably also have lower good bacteria too. So we're going to add in probiotics. I talked about adding in fermentable foods. Now, for some people, they may be probiotic intolerant, meaning they have probiotics, they feel bloated, they feel gassy, they get brain foggy, they have histamine symptoms. And this is because the bacteria in their gut is so overgrown, they cannot handle 
any beneficial bacteria. It's impacting their immune system. Right? Your gut produces, the bacteria in your gut produce most of the histamine that you're going to get exposed to. Yeah, there'll be some histamine in you know, your bacon and your citrus foods and some of those things, but most of the histamine load in your body, unless you're getting exposed to mold, is going to be from the dysbiotic bacteria. So sometimes if you're probiotic intolerant, you're sensitive to probiotics, you're sensitive to fermented foods, we have to work on you know, the mold environment, if that's a thing, or we work on you know, getting a lot of the gut bacteria down, starving out the microbes, starving out the microbes, making sure the food's breaking down, it's not fermenting, it's not rancidifying, it's not rotting in our intestinal tract. And then if those things get better, then we can come in there and support that whole stress response because there's lots of inflammation. There's TNF-alpha, there's interleukins, there's cytokines. So getting the adrenals supported so we can regulate inflammation with good healthy cortisol rhythm and levels is important. We lower the inflammation from the food. That allows us to have a better gut barrier, better immune response. We may be adding in nutrients like bone broth or glycine or collagen or N-acetylcysteine or aloe or DGL to calm down that gut lining, especially if we see eosinophilic protein elevated, if we have calprotectin elevated, if we see serum zonulin present, right? These are all good things to tell us there's gut permeability and inflammation there. We have to work on bringing that down. Then probiotics, like I mentioned, number five, we may bring in probiotics after we've addressed the microbial load whether it's dysbiotic bacteria, whether it's candida or fungal overgrowth, whether it's H. pylori, whether it's a parasite infection, we may bring that in after the fact. We may bring in your, your bifidobacter blend, lactobacillus, bifidobacter. You know, there's 10 or 12 in each, in each family there. You have the higher histamine ones like the, the KCI, paracasei, and bulgaris. We may want to cut out if you're really histamine sensitive and focus on the other ones. Or we may add in some bacillus strains, bacillus clausii, subtilis, coagulans, and lichenformis. We may add in even a beneficial yeast called Saccharomyces boulardii, which helps improve IgA levels, helps crowd out H. pylori and blasto, and can help even knock down C. diff. So there's a lot of good beneficial bacteria we may add in. And the sequencing of it is really important. I see a lot of conventional or a lot of functional medicine doctors saying they're just over-prescribing probiotics and they're doing it early and patients are getting worse. They're getting brain foggy. It's messing up their motility. You, there's a time and place for everything. And I find probiotics tend to be better after we've done a lot of the weeding. Now we can throw some of the seeds down and we'll throw down seeds with beneficial fiber, whether it's fermentable fibers in a supplement or we're adding in some of the moderate to higher FODMAP foods after to kind of add in some of that good beneficial prebiotic fertilizer, if you will, to help those seeds grow. So it just depends where someone's at and how sensitive they are. We may add it in supplement wise. We may gently start to nudge back in some of those moderate to higher FODMAP foods as long as they can tolerate it without any significant backslide. But the big ones that we'll use are going to be the bifidobacter, the lactobacillus, some of the spore-based probiotics and the saccharomyces. Again, there's ones in my line that I'll use. I'll put them in the reference section down below. The probioflora and the sacroflora are some of the big ones that we'll use. And we'll use some of the true fiber, which is usually more plant-based fiber that are going to be non-inflammatory. So more like celery roots, more like apple pectin, more like carrot root or carrot fiber. So we'll do some of those things too. We may even add in like a lower FODMAP kind of inulin or chicory root or sun fiber. This can be beneficial too. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed today's video. If you did, please feel free and let me know. I just kind of want to make sure everything makes sense to you, give you a good take on, you know, my assessment of what leaky gut is, uh, what some of the top five things you can do to work on it. Get tested too, because if you're coming into this and this issue is chronic, it's good to get some testing so you know where you're at. If you're coming in and this has been maybe a short issue for you, hasn't been bugging you that long, maybe only a few months, start off with some of the simple diet changes, see where you're at. If you want to dive in deeper, there'll be a link down below to reach out to my team and staff. We're happy to help you on the functional medicine side worldwide if you need that support. But again, look holistically, try to apply one or two things that I mentioned. If you want to dive in deeper with testing, you know, we'll do different stool testing options or even breath or even organic acids to look a little bit deeper. Organic acids can be really excellent for picking up some of the C. diff or picking up some of the candida as well. So if you want to dive in deeper, we'll put some references down below. All right, guys, thanks for listening and make sure you subscribe and share with friends and family. Take care, y'all.